ArmstrongEconomics.com, and I am very happy to have him on the X-22 Report Spotlight. Martin, welcome to the Spotlight. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me. Hey, thanks for being here. And I wanted to head out to Europe, Germany in particular. Uh, Commerce Bank, they're laying off about 9,000 employees, and it's all over the media where Deutsche Bank, it looks like they might be in trouble. Right now, when you look at Deutsche Bank, are they in trouble at this point, or is everything okay with that bank? They're in trouble. I mean, all the European banks, the, the difference between those and I would say the United States is that in the U.S., the reserves of a bank are effectively only federal debt. So when they created the euro, the problem was there was no federal central debt. So to be politically correct, they all had to have a piece of everybody else. Um, so essentially, as as Greece goes down, you know, Portugal, Italy, etc., you're talking about undermining the reserves of of the European Central, you know, of the central banking system as a whole. So, you know, you have banks that weren't even into derivatives per se in trouble. I mean, like um, in Italy, etc. So, Deutsche Bank was extremely aggressive uh, on the uh, derivative side. They they lost a fair chunk of money on the 2007 crisis, uh, and it's been really a uh, a a progressive decline they've been you know re- trying to reduce as much as possible but you know Merkel's you know staff came out and said no there will be no bailout for them and so you know the stock has fallen almost 10 percent just ever since so it it's really in a, a serious crisis here because you have to realize that Deutsche Bank is not only just the biggest bank of Germany, it's effectively the, the Cadillac of Europe. So it, it, it's not looking good. The, the whole European situation is, it, it's just a real disaster. Um, you know, they came to us uh, when they were creating the euro and I told them flat out right back then. I mean, I've published it. It's, it's, you know, over the web, um, that it would fail. They had, I explained to them that you had to consolidate and create a federal debt. Otherwise, the euro could never compete with the dollar. And they said that they were afraid to do that at the time. They just wanted to get the currency through. That if they started talking about consolidating the debt, it would be seen as a bailout for Greece or Portugal, etc. So they left everybody with it, with their own debt. And that's been really the, the Achilles heel to the whole thing. They said they would eventually get back to, you know, to consolidating the debt, but they never did. Merkel said she's not going to bail out, but she did say they're going to do whatever they possibly can to save Deutsche Bank. Do you think? They would move to uh, doing bail-ins if this bank goes? Well, that is the situation that is the $64 billion question, if not a trillion-dollar one. <laughs> I mean, that's what she did effectively to uh, everybody else. So what you've had is you've had the bonds going negative over there on 10 years, etc., because capital assumed that if the euro goes, uh, they would rather have German than Greek or Italian or French because they thought if the euro collapses, they'll get to which mark. Now the question becomes, does Germany blink? And if, honestly, if you're looking at a bail-in, you're looking at really a major crisis because Deutsche Bank's the biggest bank in, in Germany. You're going to destroy the economy. And if she bails bails it out, then you're going to have everybody bailing out of the the bonds, etc., and say, oh, my God, you know, maybe I better run to the dollar. So it, it's, it's you know, it's not a very good situation over there at all because they've never addressed the issues of the faulty design of the euro to begin with. I mean, uh, Deutsche Bank has a very large derivative book. Do you think this would be like a chain reaction where it would affect other banks if this bank goes? Derivative book is about six times the GDP of of Germany 
as a whole. But, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of like a, looking at the extreme side. Mm-hmm. What you really have to look at is really the net. And if it's what nets out on their own book is probably okay. It's the cross bank. Uh, if other banks have used it, but you'll end up in the same thing as like Lehman and, you know, they'll start shorting it, um, things of that nature. So, uh, I don't think it's as great as some of the people have explained, um, because you really have to look at the net net off their books and between the banks. So yes, it could, it could create a, a contagion as we saw, you know, coming out of 07. So you mentioned that the EU, um, they're not doing so well. And we know that uh, the ECB, they've been, there were negative interest rates. They've been buying corporate bonds. I think they're looking to buy equities. What else can they do? I mean, none of this has really helped, has it? Has it really helped the European Union? Zero. I mean, this quantitative easing that everyone assumed, oh, you know, if the Fed did it, oh, this is going to be hyperinflation, etc. You know, it's it's just false dreams because how do you get inflation? Inflation comes if the if the money's in the hands of the consumer. Mm-hmm. You know, fine, you bailed out the banks, but then look at what the banks did. They went to the Fed and they said, "Gee, you know, uh, we don't have anything to buy. You should pay us interest directly." So then they created excess reserves. You know, so you you know, okay, fine, ever all like, oh, the Fed, you know, monetized. Okay, but they have almost three trillion dollars sitting there in excess reserves. So the money was never put into the system. If the banks had lent it to people, actually done something for the economy, that's one thing, but they didn't. You know, they, they have hoarded money themselves. And, um, so everything the Fed did really hasn't been a robust recovery. This is one of the shallowest recoveries ever since. And it's it's largely because of what the Fed did and what these central banks are doing. I wanted to move here to the United States. You wrote an article about a pension crisis. And many people are out there talking about there's a problem with pensions. They're underfunded. When you say there's a pension crisis, what do you actually mean? Most of your crisis is predominantly in the public sector mm-hmm. you have um you have several states that have been lobbying um for example california illinois uh new york and texas where the leaders in behind the curtain lobbying uh effectively that they uh, that what they want to do is seize all the private pensions and then the state would manage that because they're broke on the on the public side. So it's it's always this Ponzi scheme. Um, Obamacare. What was the real design of Obamacare? They were effectively going to fine any youth who didn't buy it, and they were looking at getting the youth to have to pay premiums for things they don't really need that would then offset the expenses for the other side. So it's always a Ponzi scheme that the government does. It, it's never an outright uh, program, per se. And that's why Obamacare has been been failing, because, you know, first they put in a fine of $75. You said, well, $75 a year. OK, that's cheaper than $300 a month. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, you just have these, acad- you know, it's partly academics and Partly people that are there running government have never worked in the private sector. They, they don't see it. They under, they think all they have to do is write a law and you must do it. So as long as you're going to have people running governments like that and think their power is the pen, well, good luck. I mean, because the people do not necessarily do that. Does everybody drive 55 five miles an hour down the road? No, <laughs> maybe, you know, that's the answer. <laughs> yeah. Let, let me ask you, um, gold right now is 13 and change. And we see gold has moved up since December of 2015. And, you know, people are out there and they're talking about gold going to, you know, 5,000, 10,000, whatever the number is. What is your forecast on gold? Where where do you believe it is heading? Longer term. All right. Not 
within a year or two. But you, you, you look out further, then the maximum we could possibly come up with on gold would be really $5,000. That's it. Um, and, you know, a lot of the gold promoters, you know, they talk about, you know, 50,000, 100,000. You know, it, it's just ridiculous. It's, you know, it's really, really absurd. And the bulk of the money that would go in gold is really just individuals, not institutions. Institutions could buy the gold stocks, but they can't really invest in gold per se because it doesn't pay a dividend. So it, that doesn't do any good for a pension fund. Um, they need income. Um, and, you know, so the, a lot of the gold promoters are saying, oh, paper, gold, etc." you know, well, those that did have gold, they leased it out the least, you know, earned some income. Um, so it's 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 not it, it's it's really a retail market more than institutional. So, I mean, gold will go up, but, you know, it begrudgingly, largely because it's um, the government has been hunting taxes everywhere it, it's really you know getting very bad i know people that were in the you know gold refining business and it, they've quit and gotten out because the government comes in and says they have to document every ounce where it comes from and where it goes to they're tracking everything so this is the hunt for money they're, the governments are just flat outright broke and instead of reforming anything, it's like, um, you know, just like, you know, Hillary in a debate last night, what'd she say? Oh, we're going to tax the rich. Okay. If you took all the money from the rich, mm -hmm. everything, Bill Gates's money, you know, uh, Soros, all of them, put it all together. It doesn't balance the budget for a year. So, you know, fine, you're talking about, oh, he's worth $60 billion. We're in the trillions. So how, are you, how is taxing the so-called rich going to do anything? Uh, it, it never, the money never gets to the middle class anyhow. It always goes into the politicians' pockets. And uh, it's, it's just never going to work. So um, unfortunately, this, this is, the price of government. It's why Europe isn't recovering. You, you have a situation there where fine, they monetize, but then they keep raising taxes. You know, if, if <clears throat> I say, well, I'll lend you money at 1%. If you can't at least make 2%, you're not going to borrow and pay one. It's, it's the difference between the two. It's not the empirical level of interest rates that matter. It's if you can make a profit, if I say I'll give it to you 10 and you think you can double it and make 20, you'll take it at 10. You know, it's funny. You mentioned um, taxes. And, and I mean, if we think back to when they uh, went ahead and implemented the income tax, didn't they tell us that they were only going to tax the wealthy? And oh, that yeah. tax went to the middle class. And then it went to the poor. So that wealth tax most likely will end up hitting the middle class, then the lower middle class. And then everyone will be taxed once again. Um, well, I'll tell you, I was in Australia. They passed the luxury tax. Mm -hmm. They pitched it as great saying that it was, they were going to tax the Ferraris, the fur coats, and the French wine. And everybody cheered, yeah, go get the rich. <laughs> they passed it. What was in it? All electrical products. <laughs> so, I mean, you went to go buy a TV. Suddenly, you paid a luxury tax. You bought a clock radio, luxury tax. I mean, they always lie. That That's just simply the way it is. That is true. So you wrote an article, uh, The Coming Dark Age, uh, and you had many different examples in there about the dark age. Now, when you say we're coming into it or we're in a dark age, what are you talking about? Well, when you <clears throat> historically you run into these dark ages where the corruption in government just becomes so pervasive that it it's you can't reform it and the whole thing just simply collapses um the example i gave for example you know like on japan mm -hmm. each emperor came in and what he did he devalued the outstanding money supply to a tenth of his new coins i mean the coins were always just iron or bronze so you weren't talking about 
you know, a precious metals, you know, content to it. And so what happens is that eventually the Japanese realized, hey, the emperor dies. I lose 90 percent of whatever my savings are. So they started not accepting the coins of, of their own country. Chinese coins circulated and bags of rice. And eventually what happened was the Japanese government lost the right to even issue coins for 600 years. Um, you, when the fall of Rome happens, uh, you know, it, it took effectively 600 years before you start seeing gold coinage come back. That wasn't until the mid 1200s. So you, you go to a point in time, you know, what was, you know, the feudal system? Why, why did that happen? Cause the central government collapses and then everybody just locally you know, create their own little economies to survive. So, uh, you, this is historically, it's pervasive. It's happened in every economy in Greece. You have the heroic period, uh, with Agamemnon and Troy and all that. And then you go into a dark age. Then you come back to the period of the Hellenistic period under Alexander the Great. So you have these periods where the danger is, is that it just becomes so per pervasive and corrupt that the system completely collapses and then you don't go back. Uh, you disperse. Uh, the term <clears throat> we have suburbia is Latin. It meant that they moved out of the cities and dispersed. So Rome, for example, um, in 180 AD, was the first biggest city in the world, had a population of one million. That fell to 10,000. Uh, people just walk away from their properties because they were taxing things dramatically to the point you just said, fine, it's yours, goodbye. You know, um, and they leave. And this is what creates a dark age. You lose the central power, the central control, and people then migrate out and it'd be like the United States, all 50 states breaking up. So do you think what we're, we're entering a dark age or, or are we in one? No, there's a risk of this happening by probably 2032 on the other side of that. And it's, it's just that the system has become so corrupt. Why did the founding fathers say no direct taxation? No income tax whatsoever. We had none until 1913. Hmm. All right. It's because, you know, <clears throat> it's a difference between liberty, you know, and basically just being an economic slave. Everything you do, everything you earn, all right, you have to report to the government. You cannot legally mail more than $25 um, in the United States. Oh, that's cash that you, you can't put cash in a safety deposit box. Read the, the fine, you know, the fine print. That's money laundering. You're hiding money from the government. And, uh, it's, they have to know everything you do. If you found $10 on the ground, where'd you get it from? Um, my sister bought a house and, uh, on the mortgage, she had to go through every check that she ever deposited in her account going back like seven years. And my mother had given her some checks to buy, you know, to pay reimburse her for medicine or whatever. Every single check had to be explained. What was this for? What was that for? It, it's getting to be really abusive. And, um, uh, it, you know, it's everywhere. If you're leaving Italy and it looks like you have too much, you know, gold jewelry on, they take you off to the side and weigh it. Um, I was in Brussels and meetings with the government there. And I hopped on the, the train to run over for a meeting in London. I was pretty much the only guy in a uh, suit and tie. Everybody else was in jeans and sneaks. I just was running over to get to a hotel so I could get changed. I'm the one pulled over by the customs in, in London. I looked at him. I said, what? He says, yeah, you, come here. I said, what's the, you know, <clears throat> I said, he says, uh, where'd you buy your ticket? I said, I bought my ticket in Brussels. I said, I'm American, all right? 
I had to show where I bought the ticket because he was cons- he was looking. Did I really live in London as an American and was coming back and maybe with money? It's just nuts. You take a, a train from Zurich to Luxembourg. It goes through France. They stop the train and the French have police. They come through looking through everybody's bags, looking for money. They confiscated, you know, $10 million worth of bonds from an Italian who was on a train trying to go to Switzerland. You can't have money anymore. If it's, if it's not declared, must be illegal somehow and they're entitled to it. They don't have to prove anything anymore. Uh, do you think this is happening because the system is breaking down? And they're trying to get as much as they possibly can. I mean, the United States has a FATCA, they have GATCA. And in, in the beginning of our, uh, of us talking, you mentioned that they're trying to bring in more and more revenue. Um, they're taxing everything. Do you think this is all part of the system breaking down and they need to go after every single person just, to, I guess, to pay the interest on the debts? Yeah, I mean, uh, if you just read uh, Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, it, it's exactly the same thing. Um, that's why history repeats. I mean, human nature doesn't change. That's why it repeats. All right. Politicians, um, from ancient times, they said there's a politician under every rock. Uh, it, it's, that's it. They take, your money and they spend it and they squander it. They never give anything really back to of any substance. Um, and they, they just lie like crazy. It's, uh, they're up for sale. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing. Like, and the press tends to be right in bed with them. I mean, it was the Clinton administration that removed Glass Siegel. It was the Clinton administration that uh, put in mandatory minimums that, you know, now like up to 40 percent of black males have been in prison. All right. You now the Clintons are the ones that that made student loans non-dischargeable and gave that to the banks. I mean, it's yet they stand up and say they were for everybody, you know, other than the bankers. Uh, it, it's just amazing. But I mean, and nobody calls them out on anything. But. Uh, that's the way it is. So do you think from everything that you've been looking at, uh, are we heading for another crisis? Oh, yes. There's no question about that. We have um, what is going to happen is effectively the markets are coiling. All right. Everybody keeps saying, oh, the stock market is going to crash. All right. When the stock market crashes, usually the bond market goes up. Money's got to go someplace. It runs from the stocks, goes to the bonds. Are you really going to take the money and go to the bond market and say, here, government, I'll, you know, you can keep 10% just to hold my money? I mean, we're at a, we've reached the bubble in bond markets. This is it. And so the markets are coiling. You have probably the vast majority of these analysts saying, oh, the stock market's going to crash, whatever. Retail participation's at historic lows. How are we going to get a crash like 87 or 2000 or, you know, or 2007 if the retail public's not there? It's going to go up, not down. Because what will happen is when people finally realize um, this is really messed up and the danger is on the government side, not the private side, then you flip the other way around. You sell government bonds and you run into equities. Because, you know, that is at least um, a place to park money. That's what the big money will do. And I had one guy say, oh, you're wrong. S&P is a historic high is a 23. I said, really? In 2000, the dot-com bubble, the P.E. ratio reached 50. But you know what the historical high was? It was 120. When was that reached? 2009. So you're saying that there's going to be a, a bond collapse, not an equity collapse. It's the bond markets that are really um, in serious, serious trouble because you can't go really effectively any lower in rates. <clears throat> and the, the, the crisis this develops is that all the pension funds, particularly the, the uh, public sector funds, are 
effectively, really, they're, they're insolvent. It's really, they needed 8%, all right, uh, to, to break even. They don't have the money. They, they cannot earn it. And then you take a lot of these countries, um, they, they mandatory make private pension funds and public pension funds invest in government bonds. Then you take the interest rates to negative. I mean, this is honestly, it's like the three stooges running the world economy. I mean, um, you, you just look at them and you shake your head. I mean, this is why Janet Yellen has inherited a real nightmare. So she keeps saying, and people aren't paying attention to what she's saying. Mm -hmm. She's saying we have to normalize interest rates. Why is she saying that? Because she knows there's a massive default and pension funds on the horizon. And she keeps saying, we have to raise interest rates. And everybody, oh, my God, you can't raise interest rates. Everything will crash. If you don't get the interest rates up to normal levels, all the pension funds are going down. Social Security goes, goes negative next year, and so is Medicaid. Social Security can only be invested in U.S. government bonds. They can't earn enough money to pay out what's owed. When the bond market comes down, like you're saying, how bad is this going to be for like the everyday person? You know, the guy work, work or the girl working on the street, um, having a job, having their pension. What's going to happen to those people? Like, what, what are they going to see? Is it going to be like 2008? It, it would be more like the Great Depression. That's the last time you had a massive um, sovereign debt default because we're looking at government debt. Um, I mean, they don't want to talk about that. Um, that. In, in the sovereign debt before that was in the 1840s. It was, it was all the states that went bust. And, um, uh, in 1931, all of Europe basically went bust except, you know, Britain went into a moratorium and they eventually came out of it. Uh, China went bust. South America went bust for the fourth time in a row. Um, you, that's what made it Great Depression so great. You can take the stock market to 10 cents on the dollar. That's not going to create a Great Depression. Where is the vast majority of money invested? It's in bonds. So you destroy the bond market. Now you're talking about destroying capital formation. It's not the stock market. The stock market's the fluff. But it's it's the bond market where all this money resides. If you just took what's in excess reserves at the Fed, and the corporate cash, all right, you're talking about five to six trillion dollars of cash sitting just there. Okay. Can you imagine what the Dow Jones would do with six trillion dollars? So, you know, it's, there's two sides to every coin. Sometimes it's the private sector that collapses. Other times it's the public sector. We're in, unfortunately, a side where it's the governments that are collapsing. They have promised the moon. They've done nothing. These people are incapable of any kind of fiscal management whatsoever. When the government collapses like this, like you're saying, and, and we have this problem like the Great Depression, uh, people are going to lose jobs? Sure. I mean, it's, you know, job growth is not great right now because um, taxes are too high. They keep raising taxes and taxes and taxes. And you know, fine, you know, Hillary stands up and says, oh, we're going to tax the rich. But they never say who are the rich. The rich is defined by the tax code as $250,000 household income. We're not talking about billionaires and trillionaires here. That's basically good luck, you know, starting a small business with 250 k So how long... Will this last, this this collapse of government? I mean, it's not just going to be the United States. It's going to be worldwide? Yeah, I mean, it starts outside. It, it's never going to start from the, from the center. Uh, the United States will be the last to fall. This is why the dollar has been uh, so strong. It's why <clears throat> the central banks lately, China, et cetera, they've been selling U.S. government bonds at the request of the Fed trying to keep the dollar down but it doesn't it doesn't stay down because <clears throat> you have all the chinese rushing to get out of there they they don't trust their government 
So they've taken over practically the West Coast. Even, you know, from Vancouver, they've been one of the biggest buyers, highest ticket buyers in real estate in the United States. <clears throat> in Europe, you have the same, you know, crisis over there. It's, it's just not, you know, feasible. So the dollar is the only reservoir left. And I can tell you, um, <clears throat> I mean, as you know, I've, do consulting with a lot of governments. So I, I see the, I understand what's going on behind the curtain. I'm there. And I can tell you that there is a lot of people now talking in Washington that the dollar should not be the reserve currency. That they realize that what's happening here is that the Federal Reserve can't raise interest rates so easily because they have the IMF and everybody else saying, oh, please don't do that. You're going to bankrupt everybody else outside the United States. So the Fed has become the central bank of the world by default. So how do you get the, your power back to manage your own economy? The only way to do that is is to get rid of the dollar as reserve currency. But um, and that's not an easy task. It can't be simply declared, all right, you can't use your U.S. dollar as reserve currency. It, you, you just, that's it. I mean, you can't stand up and de declare it. The IMF um, has been trying to sell the idea of of the SDR, but uh, that's not a currency. It's It's basically a basket of currencies. I mean, you've had these people saying, oh, well, you know, China is going to become part of the uh, SDR on October 1st. The dollar is going to crash. The SDR is a basket of currencies. It's not an independent thing. So part of the, S of the SDR, the vast majority of it is the dollar. So um, you've got the British pound in the SDR. I mean, these things in the euros in there, they said the same thing with the euro. That didn't have any effect. Um, it's a place where you're going to park money. That's what a reserve currency is. Can all the pension funds honestly stand up and say, yeah, okay, fine. We're going to buy Jap, you know, Chinese government debt. No. If you, you're not at that level of, of trust yet and their court systems, et cetera, can you really defend your money? We're not there yet. Eventually we'll get there, but that's, you're talking about a couple more decades. When the dollar is no longer the reserve currency, what happens here in the United States? Um, I mean, what I argue for is that it shouldn't be the IMF because the IMF is just a, a corrupt organization that has been bought and paid for many times over. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I think a brand new agency should should be started. And and what becomes the reserve is effectively a uh, a basket of currencies. But <clears throat> if we eliminate taxes. Uh, the income tax and just went to a consumption tax, it changes everything. I mean, we have all this argument about uh, immigration, all the rest of this stuff, and, and fine. What is the problem? The problem is that only Americans, citizens, pay income tax. So you can have <clears throat> an equal amount of illegal aliens. They do not pay income tax. So the solution is obvious. It should just be eliminate the income tax. Everybody pays a consumption tax. It doesn't matter where you're from. And all the studies show would, you would end up with more money in revenue than less. But you have people that just want to be able to punish somebody who earns more than they do. From everything that you've been looking at, um, when do you predict the bond market to come down? I mean, do you have a, a time frame when you think this is going to crash? It's It should start next year. I mean, we've been basically saying, look, we had four um, major elections, and this has been what we're saying. This is like a year from political hell. The first was Brit exit. The second one is the United States presidential elections. Then we have the French elections. Holland is below 10%, and then you have Merkel. And, you know, Merkel's party's been coming in third now. So, what you're looking at is by the time we get to to the summer of of next year, whatever you thought about the world um, stability, you know, politically, whatever, 
everything can be completely upside down. This is the uncertainty. This is why markets are coiling. They're not rallying. They're not declining. Nobody is like, who's, you know, who's on first? Mm. It, it's almost, I mean, I remember years ago trading, all right, fine, when Reagan was shot. Oh, his bullet was dipped in cyanide or whatever. Rumors were get going. The markets went dead quiet when the Pope was shot. Everybody was calling like, well, what do you do when a poker shot? Nobody knew what to do. So the markets went completely flat. <laughs> um, it's kind of like that. It, it's like, well, what do we do? I don't know. Is, is if Hillary is elected, are we just going to be nothing but immediate impeachment proceedings and all their emails then come out that they've been holding? Um, look, I mean, she took money from seven foreign governments. I mean, does the Clinton Foundation end? When she gets into the White House, or is that just going to be a backdoor for more for more political payoffs? I mean, it, it, there is just such a quagmire of of a mess that we have. Because honestly, who the heck really even wants to run for a head of 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 a government anymore? Um, people that I know that would be really qualified, nobody wants to touch it. They're going to get into oh well, you know, you lied to your girlfriend when you were in high school, you know. Uh, it's just ridiculous. It's completely ridiculous. So we have people that are not, you know, um, what's Hillary's qualifications for an economy? Zero. Um, or Merkel or, or, or Holland. I mean, none of them have any economic background. Zero. Martin, I, I really appreciate you coming on the X22 Report Spotlight. Thank you very much. Once again, how can people see your work? Uh, they can go to our uh, website, armstrongeconomics.com. Again, once again, I really appreciate you. Thank you for being on the spotlight. Well, thank you for inviting me. Thank you.